Hey everyone. I am sorry <laughs> that I've been away a while. It's good to be back. I've been really busy, uh, both at, at work and on sort of like a pet project that I might talk about at some point on the channel. Uh, it, it hasn't anything at all to do with the channel or anything, so you needn't worry about anything changing here. Uh, and I do have some ideas for the next game that I'm going to be LPing after this uh, short series. I think this is just going to be like four videos, this one. Uh, up front, it's not Bloodborne. Uh, we're, <laughs> we are actually PS4-less at the moment. Uh, P was using it heavily for a while for like a... Oh god, I should know the name of this game. It's like an online kind of shoot 'em up game. It's the one with, uh, with Peter Dinklage as the uh, very bored sounding robot. I'm sure you know the name. Uh, so anyway, uh, apparently something broke on the PS4, like with the disk drive or something. So it's he had to like send it back to get repaired. So it's going to be another game after this. Uh, also, at some point over the next probably week or two, I'm going to be uploading one of those dreaded uh, Minecraft videos to the channel, too. Uh, I did, I gauged interest on the channel a while back, for those who don't know, and there was like this resounding no that nobody wanted to see Minecraft videos, which I totally understand. Uh, so I want to reassure you that this is not going to turn into a Minecraft channel, but I played in a, a UHC match last weekend and uh, recorded my perspective of it, and I want to put it on the channel so that all the other players involved can watch it. So if you're interested in Minecraft, feel free to watch it, and if not, skip it, but, you know, don't... You don't need to worry about, like, me uploading tons and tons of just playing Minecraft videos and the channel turning into that. Uh, whenever we do something interesting on the server, I might record it and upload it for people, but that's kind of it. Uh, again, just because... And, I, like, I personally, I know that you guys, for the most part, aren't really interested, but also I don't really like watching just, like, Minecraft building stuff, unless there's, like, some specific event or something interesting going on. So, anyway, uh, what you're watching here is possibly me getting killed by the Skeleton Lords, but this is the sort of behind-the-scenes footage from the Dark Souls 2... DLCs in New Game Plus series. Um, I, after like a few intro episodes of the New Game Plus series, I kind of jumped ahead to the DLCs because that was where like the majority of the new content was. And I sort of stopped recording myself playing through the base game as I went because I kind of did the two hand in hand. So this is all that footage. I didn't record live commentary for it, and I kind of rushed through it. Like, at some point here you'll see I throw on, like, heavy armor, big weapon, and just try to get through the levels as quickly as possible, because I realized that um, there's not really all that much that you haven't already seen from the, like, not new game plus of the, of the Dark Souls 2 LP. Um, and there's just, like, there's a few extra enemies sprinkled here and there, like these red phantoms. Uh, and in, like, a couple of the boss rooms. So, yeah, this is just sort of a thing for me to talk over. Because I'm going to be uh, answering a bunch of your questions here. Both about the Souls series as a whole, and <laughs> whatever other randomness you all thought up to ask. So, without further ado, uh, let's hop right in to the first question. So, a user named FatoriXX asked, How old are you, and how did you come to play this kind of video game? So, I turned 34 years old a couple of months ago. And I figure this kind of video game probably means the Souls series. Uh, Dark Souls was definitely the first game I had played in that particular style. I had played a few, like, mouse and keyboard games where the camera was sort of in your character's head and you clicked to shoot at stuff. Um, Star Siege Tribes is the one that kind of springs to mind immediately. But I had never played one with kind of controls as kind of controls set up like this, like where the you had the two trigger buttons that kind of performed actions on the on the related arms of your character. And, uh, and like with the two strict 
to control stick motion um, because I never really played console games. So I guess the closest that I can think of would have been um, GoldenEye, which did have like the one controller stick and um, and then you like clicked a button to aim, which kind of put you into like aiming mode where the control stick then controlled where you were looking instead of like making you move forward, back, left, and right. Um, and there was like a directional pad, but it was like really awkward to use. So generally like you didn't make yourself look up and down unless you were in aim mode. You just kind of ran around the level with like, like your gun aimed at a certain height. Uh, so uh, I, I mentioned the controller because it, it was my ineptitude at using the like dual stick controller that spawned the idea to record Dark Souls in the first place. I think I've probably told this story in, in previous commentary, but just in case, the, the short version is that I played about an hour, maybe two hours, of Borderlands 2 with P, and we couldn't stop laughing whenever I drove the car around. Uh, and I use the word drove generously here. So he said that I should play Dark Souls, probably thinking that it'd be an episode or two of me getting squished by things and running into walls. Uh, and I and I did a bit at first, but not that bad, I, I hope. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, sometime around Undeadburg, I would say, I started to really like the game. Um, the encounter with the Black Knight there in particular, like where I was up on the roof and throwing stuff down on him and then trying to like jump onto his head. Oh man. So, <laughs> yeah, oh, that was a great fight. Um, but so, okay, yeah, admittedly, I was originally going to be one of those like, hey, let's watch her suck at video games, haha, -ha, kind of things. But, um, but after like a few strangers watched the video and left comments, uh, in, like the first episode or two, you know, it wasn't any longer just like a joke for the friends. And plus I kind of liked the game already. So I decided just to kind of play the thing instead, like I would have if nobody was watching or as close as I could to it. Uh, which does mean it goes really freaking slow at the beginning of the LP. Uh, well, throughout really, but particularly at the beginning because we knew like nothing about video editing. So, and I had no idea like what was what with like the control buttons and everything. So, it, it turns out, I think, that the sorts of things I do like, which is, you know, like to ask a lot of questions and to make a record of what I do and whom I talk to and to draw maps and diagrams and read everything and look at everything and use everything with every other thing, it really pays off in the style of game. Uh, you know, the, the Souls games are... They're a game that reward you for patience and for observation and for memory and for exploration and, like, attention to detail and stuff. So, and then, you know, it's just that with a really fun combat system, like, kind of layered on top of it. Um, and lots and lots of things to fall off of. So, yeah, I don't know. It was just, it was a good fit, I think, for my kind of personality and stuff that I liked in games. So, there you go. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Fatori XX. User Morat48 asked, uh, your opinion, DLC versus base game. Actually, a lot of people ask this. Uh, and also, I'm curious what your top 10 bosses are for the entire series put together. Um, I enjoyed the majority of Dark Souls 2 DLCs um, more than the base game, uh, especially when it came to like telling a story and the level design and the boss fights. Um, I, I really liked, for example, the, the buttons that moved walls and platforms in the sunken city. That was really cool. Um, going through, I guess, what I would call the, the challenge routes, um, which are at least what people say, that they're sort of, in each of the DLCs, it's like the one route that's sort of intended for you to like do multiplayer, like cooperative runs. Um, those were a real pain, going through them alone. But, I mean, it, it might very well have been fun if, if I did it with other people. I think if I ever play through 
the Dark Souls 2 DLCs again, I would definitely summon companions for those bits. Uh, just because the content, like when you're going through them alone, it's, it's not that fun. Um, you know, and of course that's subjective. But yeah, overall, I liked the DLC content quite a lot, actually, um, and on average more than the base game. So, okay, my top 10 <laughs> boss fights for the entire series. I give this a lot of thought. And again, this list is entirely subjective, guys. I'm sure that I liked fights that you didn't and vice versa. In fact, I, I know it for certain <laughs> because I liked the Bed of Chaos fight. Uh, so try not to hold that against me, okay? Uh, so here we go. In in order, I'll try to do this as like a, I'll, I'll try to do this as a uh, kind of official top ten list. <laughs> Number ten is uh, the Armor Spider from Demon Souls. This was a really fun fight. Uh, it's got the combination of the sort of claustrophobia-inducing arena and the the kind of like fast and frenetic soundtrack. Uh, plus a massive fireball hurling spider, so. <laughs> you know, and it's like, I liked the kind of strategy, you sort of like struggle through its volley of ranged attacks to kind of get within uh, within striking range, only to have it force you all the way back to the arena with the with like the big AoE blast. So you, you kind of like fight to get up there and then you sneak in whatever damage you can and you try to avoid getting like webbed right before the big explosion because <laughs> it prevents you from like running and rolling away uh so i yeah i really liked the design i liked everything about that fight um and it was kind of the only one like it i think i i can't really think of anything else in any of the three games that had like a similar mechanic to that the only one i can think of maybe would be well i don't want to say it because it's later on the list <laughs> So, alright, that's number 10. Uh, favorite boss number 9 was the Fool's Idol from uh, Demon Souls. So you've got from, from kind of the fiery and frantic armored spider, we now go to the cool and slow sort of uh, idol fight. This, this was a creeptastic boss that, in my opinion, perfectly capped the, the whole kind of Latria prison area. Uh, you know, the, the actual fight was like one part memory game because you've got the shocking glyphs on the floor that you have to look out for. And then one part observation to determine which copy of the boss is real. Um, and somebody asked me whether uh, I realized that it was the main, like it was the real version of the boss that shot like the big uh, ball of energy. I, I don't actually remember whether I figured that out while I was fighting it or whether that was something that like somebody told me later or I, I saw in a video later. Um, it could be that I didn't figure that out um, at all when I fought it the first time. Um, so uh, so music-wise it, it had a really kind of spooky theme that makes you feel like a little bit unhinged. And of course, at the end, the kind of twist ending, uh, when I realized that my kindness to the muttering fool above would uh, would have to be paid for. Uh, great fight, um, particularly in the context of the zone that it that it completed. Number eight would be Dark Sun Gwendolyn from Dark Souls. First of all. Major kudos to FromSoft for rewarding the player who kind of digs at the game's lore with a secret boss. Uh, I loved unearthing the story of, of Gwyn's family, and wondering at the inconsistencies, and then having the detective work pay off. Like, it was incredible that that that, that could happen. The, the fight itself had the kind of interesting mechanic, and this is, this is the one that I would sort of compare to the armor spider. Um, and I think, I, I think that boss, like, it took me a few attempts. It had a kind of, it almost had like a dreamlike quality to it. You know, with like the, the seemingly endless hallway and your target always sort of dancing just out of reach. And 
when it's over, you stand before Gwyn's tomb and you realize exactly what you've done. Um, oh god, and what was the deal with that empty treasure chest in there? Did I ever get an answer to that? You guys remember what I mean? There was, like, when you finished the Gwendolyn fight, there were, like, a couple of treasure chests in the room at the end of the hall. And one of them was already open. I think it was already opened. And it was empty. Maybe I had to open it, but either way, it was it was empty already. So, what what's in that? Was, was there some way, like, if you do things in different orders or find something first, that there would be items in there? Anyway. Uh, boss number seven would be the Bell Gargoyles. So, the Gargoyles weren't exactly my first fight. There was the, uh, the Asylum Demon and the Taurus Demon before them. But I'd say the Gargoyles were the first brawl, really. And because of that, it, it sticks out in my mind. So, like, I remember the, the first attempt with my trusty minion, Solaire. Uh, during which I died horribly and he fought on. Perhaps to victory in another slip of time, I like to think. And that, that moment of like dawning horror when I realized that there were multiple enemies in the fight. Uh, you had the epic music and the rooftop arena that kind of overlooks all of the areas that you've been exploring for the previous few hours. Um, Kind of an aside, it was around this point in the LP, like when I fought the gargoy the Bell Gargoyles, that I remember I started to have dreams at night that incorporated <laughs> Dark Souls elements into them. <laughs> yes, this happened. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I remember because there was like the, the thing where you summoned Solaire, I remember that was like somehow worked into a dream of mine. Uh, I don't remember whether it was specifically like Solaire that I summoned, but I remember that the, I remember seeing like a summoning sign on the ground in a dream at one point. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> there's number seven. Number six, I would say, is the Burnt Ivory King fight from Dark Souls 2. Uh, very unlike anything else, you you lead an army into battle against another army. <laughs> what more really needs to be said? <laughs> the, the start of the fight is just chaos. There are blades and, like, like leaping walls of fire everywhere. <laughs> and then you win, hopefully, and face the Ivory King with your, like, lone remaining soldier who makes it through the fight with you. Oh, man. I was I was heaps impressed by the bosses that they added to the DLCs, and uh, this one stands out for doing something really different from anything else in the series. Number five would be uh, the False King Alant from Demon Souls. It's a long road <laughs> to this boss. You go past knights and drakes and dogs and uh, kind of all the while, you are accompanied by Ostrava, who talks of the, you know, the upcoming battle, the battle ahead. So, kind of by the time the elevator doors open and you, like, step out through the fog, you're already sort of, like, tense and tingling with anticipation for the fight. You get a cutscene of the king, kind of, like, resplendent in the, like, shining silver armor. Uh, sitting or standing on the balcony overlooking his like kind of you know crumbling castle <laughs> and so he draws his sword and he slowly walks towards toward like you toward the center of the room and he's backlit by the the sun that's coming in through like the ruined wall it was a great like introduction to the fight and and then begins sort of this long battle of attrition because the fight is really like you sort of whittle his health down bit by bit um, while you're like constantly dodging his sort of almost relentless like attack set, move, like move set. And the entire fight you feel kind of like one misstep can totally turn the tide of the battle and result 
not just in your death, but even in a loss of your stats, like a permanent loss of your stats. Well, maybe not permanent, I mean, you could gain it back later, but anyway. Uh, this was a fight that just, it, it kind of shook, like, my nerves. Like, I feel, for example, if I were to play Demon Souls again, I'd be afraid of that fight. <laughs> Like, I'd be thinking about it the whole time and worried about going into it every time, even though I've already beaten it. So, good job there. I loved that one. Number four would be Knight Artorius from the Dark Souls 1 DLC. Uh, and in hindsight, actually, this fight reminds me quite a bit of the False King fight in many ways. Uh, because they kind of similarly have a series of, like, really lightning fast attacks that they deviate from to do uh, a charge move that's like interruptible. You can like rush in and get some damage. So I actually like the Artorius fight for a lot of the same reasons that I like the King Alant fight. Um, although I think the Artorius fight might have actually required a bit more technique. Uh, and plus it had a really cool backstory. I mean so did Alant. Uh, but yeah, you hear about Artorias several times throughout the base game. So when you finally square off against him in, in the, uh... What was that area called? In the Royal Wood. You realize, like, what fate the Abyss has, has assigned him. Um, kind of a, a quirky thing. I, I loved the... The kind of the environmental touch of the, like, the black Icar, like the, the sludge that he had tracked all the way from the abyss to the, to the arena where you fight him. Um, yeah, oh, great fight. Number three would be the Sanctuary Guardian, also from the Dark Souls 1 DLC. Um, in fact, I'd say of the Dark Souls 1 DLC bosses, the Sanctuary Guardian was my favorite, which I guess hints that Manus is not number 2 or 1. <laughs> uh, so it's true that I won the Sanctuary Guardian fight on my first try, but <laughs> I believe wholeheartedly that this was due to my obscenely large health pool and kind of super Estus flasks by the time I entered the arena. Um, because... The Sanctuary Guardian kicked my ass all over the arena for like the first half of the fight. I went back and I watched the footage uh, while I was like thinking of this list and uh, it was not pretty for like the whole first half of the fight. But the amount of Estus I had and the amount of life I had kind of bought me enough time to begin to make sense of its attack patterns. Um, but the Guardian was a serious brawl of a fight. I mean, I went through every spell I had, I believe. I cast every spell I had on me, and finished the fight in melee with the Moonlight Spear. <laughs> I mean, what can I say? It was like, it was a solid seven minutes of outright war, <laughs> and I was on the edge of my seat the entire time. <laughs> like... <laughs> A++++ plus 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 10 of 10 would fight again. I loved the Guardian fight. Number 2 is the Fume Knight from Dark Souls 2 DLC. Uh, I'm not positive, I, I'm pretty sure about this. I'd have to go back and check the footage, but I believe the Fume Knight saw me out more times than any other boss in the series, including Manus. Uh, so, uh, although time is kind of condensed in the LP, uh, like when you watch me fight the Fume Knight, that fight actually took me three days of playing. Like, I would, you know, log in or whatever to, to Dark Souls 2 and say, alright, today I'm going to beat the Fume Knight, and I would fight him like a whole bunch of times and die and die and die and die and say, I have no idea what to do, and stop playing, and think about it for like the whole rest of the day, and try to come up with a new strategy. Um, I, I switched gear multiple times. Uh, I, I completely rebuilt my character once, and was even considering doing it a second time, just to, just to kill one boss. Uh, usually, 
it, throughout the series, when I've struggled with a Souls boss, I would think for a couple of minutes and come up with like some small change to the strategy I'm using. Um, but the Fume Knight was simply hard. <laughs> I mean, the only thing to do was to play better, to, you know, dodge more precisely, remember every little thing and do it perfectly for six minutes of utter terror. <laughs> like, Fume Knight commands, I would say, more respect from me than any other boss I fought in the entire series. So, <laughs> he has my respect. Uh, before I go to the number one boss, who you might have guessed already, uh, I've got a couple of honorable mentions because there were a couple of bosses that I really liked and I would have loved to have them to make the list, but there were more than ten. So, the Storm King, I really enjoyed. Scorpionus Najka kicked my butt many times. Gravelord Nido was one of my favorite Dark Souls 1 bosses. Uh, Sir Alone, again from the Souls 2 DLCs. The Souls 2 DLCs had really good bosses. And, uh, and of course, for sheer number of deaths, Manus, Father of the Abyss. Um, he, he had a move set that I never once figured out how to dodge. Um, the, the whole, like, six or seven hit combination that he does, I could not figure out how to avoid getting hit by at least the second swing of that. Like, I tried dodging in many different directions, and I always got clipped by the second attack and then kind of sucked into the whole chain of them. So, yeah, that was a really hard fight both times I fought him. Um, he took me, you know, at least, I would say, like, four or five times to kill. So... Grand Finale, the number one, my favorite boss in the entire Dark Souls series. Number one, Dark Lurker. Uh, I've waxed poetic many times about this boss. My my favorite souls of this, my favorite boss of the series. Uh, of course, tucked away at the end of an area that I absolutely loathe. Uh, in a good way, of course. <laughs> every time I died to Dark Lurker, every time I died in that arena. I dreaded the run back through the chasm, because the chasm was so rough. The, the Dark Lurker is simply a brilliantly designed boss fight, in my opinion. Because, like, first it teaches you its moves. You know, here's a laser beam for you to stand under. Here's uh, some fireballs that you can run to avoid. Here's a sword in your face. Did you circle around behind me? Good job. Now... Get the fuck out, because incoming dark explosion. <laughs> so, you know, you watch, and you learn, and you think, and you start to feel like, <laughs> I've totally got this, I've got all your moves figured out. And then the actual fight starts. <laughs> suddenly, you're seeing, uh, you know, suddenly you're like doing double time, and you're swinging the camera around like crazy to keep the two baddies on the screen at the same time and, uh, <laughs> you know, are trying to figure out, like, where the other side of the dark portal is that the exploding dark ball is going to come out of. Uh, it, it's just madness once the second boss appears. Um, but you can take everything that you've learned from the first phase of the fight and use it to try to survive the second. Or, you know, get blasted in the nose by fireballs, probably. But, yes, <laughs> I award the crown for Kay's favorite Souls series boss to Dark Lurker. <laughs> now, open the depths of darkness, young undead. The dark awaits you. There is my final top ten list. Glad you asked. I spent a good long while kind of eliminating bosses and reordering them, and the list changed many times, but I'm pretty happy about this final list, so... Uh, one more time, disclaimer, totally subjective. If you disagree, let me know who you'd put on the list or who you'd strike from the list. I am i know there's a big chorus of people that are like, why is Storm King in your honorable mentions? But I really liked that fight. Uh, so, take it as you will. Let me know what your top 10 would be. So moving on to the next question, a user named Pliskin0089 asked, for me to pick three of my favorite books, and also what were my favorite movies this year. So, 
in my previous Q&A, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, I think the playlist is called something like Dark Souls Revisited, um, and I'll try to remember to put a link to it in the description. Uh, I, I answered a similar question about my favorite books, and I listed at that time the first few that came to mind. So uh, you can see my answer there, but uh, here I'll, I'll pick one more. Um, for a nonfiction book, uh, Into Thin Air by John Krakauer might be one of my favorites. It is an account of the kind of tragic 1996 disaster atop Mount Everest that is actually written by one of the climbers who was in the middle of it all. Um, he was, I, I think he was like, he was hired by a magazine to go on a, like a guided uh, ascent of Everest. Um, so he was both, uh, you know, he was both a, a writer and an avid climber. Um, and it is just, it's writing that truly shakes you. It's like one of those situations where there are many small problems that all snowball into catastrophe. You know, too many people on the mountain at once. Um, there's like a short break in the weather, so every team kind of pushes for the summit at the same time. Uh, which, along with... I, I think there were like missing fixed lines like high on the mountain. Anyway, it was this whole set of things that causes a bottleneck of climbers, uh, you know, which slows everyone down at really high altitude and leaves them all up there much, much longer than they had hoped. Um, and spending, you know, spending too much time at kind of oxygen depleting altitude just tanks everyone's decision making skills. Um, and they're there later in the day, so night is going to fall on their descent. Uh, plus there's a storm picking up. It's just a whole series of events that are just, like, <laughs> faded disaster. Um, and so, yeah, I read this story, and I got caught up in the story, and I kept finding myself thinking, like, oh, hold on a second, this is, this is not, like, this actually happened. <laughs> you know, these are real people that we're hearing about. There's a section, like, halfway through the book where, like, there's photographs of, like, you know, the pictures they took on the way up the mountain. Like, it's just, oh, you just, you know, pit of your stomach dropping kind of feeling. Very powerful writing. Utterly harrowing. Um, yeah, highly recommended book. So the other half of the question, uh, my favorite movies of the year. Uh, this is going to be a really lame answer because... We're honestly not really moviegoers anymore, so I tend to watch everything really late, like when it shows up on Netflix and, you know, we can enjoy a, a comfy sofa, pause button, and volume control. So my answer to this year movies will suck, so I'm gonna have to kind of broaden the window a bit. <laughs> let's, let's give it like five years. Um, let me see. Uh, I saw, I think this is probably within the five-year window, uh, the movie True Grit, the remake. Uh, I really liked that movie. I thought everyone like turned in really good performances, particularly uh, the the young Maddie Ross, who was, uh, I think the actress playing her uh, is a, named, um, oh god, I should remember this, uh, Haley something, Haley Steinberg, or... Steinford or something. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure the actress was 13 years old when they filmed that movie, and I mean she does such a great job. Plus it was of course, you know, a trip to see the dude <laughs> as like a, a gruff and stubborn like gunslinging marshal. <laughs> uh, you know, there's just fantastic chemistry between the two characters. Uh, as for like stuff I've seen really recently, um, I watched just a couple of days ago, I watched 2014's uh, Gone Girl with Ben Affleck and uh, Rosamund Pike. Uh, I haven't seen uh, <laughs> Ben Affleck on screen for a long time. Not since, like, you know, the Daredevil and, and uh, what was that one where he was like, I think it was called Paycheck, where he was like reverse engineering some like technology and 
could like see through the future. Like, <laughs> after those two movies, I don't think anyone can kind of blame me for being done with Ben Affleck. But honestly, he was he was good in this one. Uh, it was a surprise. Uh, I've heard that he's been he's been good in other stuff recently, but I just haven't seen it. Um, so Gone Girl was sort of like a a drama slash like thriller, I guess, with its story told through like an unreliable narrator mechanic. And so like like what is sort of from the onset set up as a a tropey kind of you know super you know like saccharine love story very quickly kind of slides like it shifts track into this really kind of captivating thriller because we, we realize that both of the lovers are darker than we initially think uh yeah th this movie it really had me going it had me like caught up in the story right up until the last literally the last five minutes of the movie which almost made me walk away and kind of broke the story for me which was a real shame because I think with a different ending to cap off what had been up until then a really thrilling ride it would have been just brand incredible movie but uh yeah kinda phoned it in on the ending I thought it was just because it didn't make sense to me like nothing that happened at the end of the movie made sense uh, given like the, the whole premise I don't know I don't I don't really want to give away like what the movie is about so um, you know, if anybody has any opinions on me that you on it that you want to kind of like either either send as like a channel message or like you can post it down in the comments, but maybe put a spoiler tag on it so other people who haven't seen the movie won't won't be told what it's about. But uh, let me know what you think of the ending because I kind of didn't like it at all. So I'm going to try to fit one more question in before the end of the video. A user named Magic Sword Makoto, which is a great name by the way, uh, asked, Are you a part of or avidly observe any gaming groups or professional leagues? Are there any accomplishments you personally hope to achieve in gaming, like with esports, or making it maybe a paid profession like magazine editing and such? So, quite the opposite, actually. Uh, gaming, it's always been a hobby, something just for fun. Uh, I, I don't really have any intention. I, I don't think I'd want to turn it into a profession. C kind of for the same reason that I don't really want to, you know, that, it, that we don't have any plans to monetize videos on the channel. I just think that making a business out of it would add a, like a layer of worry and kind of just sully the experience for me. Um, and besides, I already have a job that's, that is for me really fulfilling. It's, it's mathy and it's creative and it kind of like poses a new a new and interesting challenge every day so uh, so for me gaming and work aren't really ever likely to meet I don't think um, to the other part of the question about like gaming groups or professional leagues I honestly don't know enough about it I think to have a an informed opinion I I do tend to shy away from competitive gaming um, usually prefer cooperative stuff, but I could see how like a team versus team competition might be fun. Um, I used to play tribes, as you know, with a with a bunch of like gamers at uni, and I did. I always got a kick out of kind of this the team building, like strategizing stuff that we would go through before like uh, team versus team matches. Um, so that could be kind of fun, but yeah, I don't know. Outside of video games, the only sort of, like, league playing that I could see myself doing maybe would be for something like, like, chess or bridge. Um, but I honestly don't think I'm proficient enough at either one to play at any sort of competitive level. Uh, I, I hover around, like, the mid-1800s in online correspondence chess which is, you know, it's quite a bit different than playing over the board. Um, and these days I only kind of play, like, casual bridge games among friends. So, yeah. So, so basically the answer to the question is no. <laughs> I don't really see myself being a part of, like, any, any kind of, like, professional gaming or, or anything related to it. Uh, 
just a hobby, something that I will continue to do for fun, and uh, and that's what this channel will always be, and I hope it sticks around for a long time, and I hope that people continue to enjoy watching the videos, and uh, leave questions like this. So thank you, Magic Sword Makoto. I actually recognize your name. I know that you've you've left a great many comments on my videos, and I appreciate that too. So hope <laughs> hope hope the answer was all right. <laughs> uh, so that we are just about at the end here. We're going to be wrapping it up. I think this is one, maybe one of the last boss fights in the video. So I will uh, I'll leave you here, and thanks for watching. There will be. I believe three more videos like this one in the series, and then I've got that Minecraft thing coming up, and then uh, something else. <laughs> so look forward to it. Thanks guys, I appreciate it. Take care. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye all.